Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. I'm really excited that this is our first program um, associated with A New World, the exhibition that we're in right now. Um, I'm delighted to introduce its curator, uh, Sarah Bartlett. Sarah is uh, an anthropology, uh, poly science, and classical studies triple major. Um, very accomplished. She has all these fields. Uh, she has worked with us at University Museums for um, about six semesters since her sophomore year. Um, we so appreciate her work with us. And since 2019, uh, last September, she served as the Pullman Fellow. Um, so in that fellowship, she project managed the exhibition you walked through, um, Contemplate Japan, to come back here. Um, part of that fellowship was also the curation of this exhibition. Uh, she also serves as a WLC, or World Languages and Cultures uh, Ambassador, and is a former head of the Classics uh, Club. So uh, please help me in welcoming Sarah. Okay. Hello. So um, when I was given the opportunity to curate my own exhibit, um, I kind of already knew what subjects I wanted to look at. Um, I've always loved the ancient world and been so fascinated with history. Um, when I was kind of looking at colleges, I was asked to write an entrance essay that was about if I could have any superpower, what would it be and how would I use it to change the world? And I found myself, even though I was applying for marine biology programs, um, I found myself writing about how I wanted the ability to travel through time so that I could stand in history um, and learn about how people live their lives before, um, before today. And that's kind of exactly what I got to do here with all these objects from all these different cultures from around the world. Um, and the objects in this exhibition are organized by culture area. So there's six of them with one bonus. So we've got China, Greece, Rome, Egypt, the Americas, the Near East, and with special bonus of the Etrus Etruscans. Um, so I thought it was important to put them in their own, um, their own culture areas in that way so that you can kind of see similarities between these cultures because these weren't um, isolated by any means. They were interacting with each other, they were sharing ideas, um, and they were really kind of growing together and not independently. Um, so there were also more civilizations than in the ancient world than a lot of people assume. A lot of people think that it's just Greece, Rome, and Egypt, and those were the, the big three, and they were the ones who were kind of taking, um, taking power during that time. But there was so much more going on in the ancient world that we really don't think about, and we're not often taught about it in schools, because frankly, there's not really enough time to cover everything. Um, so... In each of these sections, I also chose a signature object that I felt um, really exemplified what I wanted to get across with each section of the exhibition. So I'm standing right here next to the section, which is China. Um, most of the objects in this case are from the Tang Dynasty, which was about 600 to 900 CE, which means the common era um, before uh, modern naming. It used to be AD. Um, and so, uh, you, on the top shelf here, you have some objects in the middle that are more for burial than anything else. Uh, the women, woman in the center uh, it would have been a burial figurine. You would see these often um, all of all different types. She's a lady in waiting um, based on the way that she is dressed, um, and she would have been there in um, the the burial chamber or however they were buried to help the deceased um, in their next to life. And down below, we have some bowls and some eating objects. Uh, you have a steamer in the middle. So basically, they would have put water in that bottom bowl and then put some sort of flame underneath it. And you could kind of insert it into that hole at the bottom there. They were able to steam and boil uh, vegetables in that way. Um, and so that's one of the things that is really kind of fascinating to me about the ancient world is that they were living thousands of years before electricity. They were able to cook their foods in similar ways that we do now. Um, they had similar spices. Their lives weren't as different from our lives, um, I guess pre-COVID, because we do a lot of things virtually now. Um, but their lives weren't that different from ours. Um, and the Tang Dynasty was known 
as the golden age for Chinese art and culture. Um, they harness this dye uh, technique that has been replicated for centuries. Um, this tricolor dye that you see in all these objects was very significant for the time period and their objects and artifacts have been replicated. You, uh, breakfast at Tiffany's, you see like little replicas of Tong horses, which you can see in our exhibition over there. Um, in, I think it's pretty in pink, there's also replicas of it. It's something that's been a symbol of extravagance for centuries. And even the Chinese themselves um, replicated this dye technique in later periods. So this Buddha statue that's at the bottom of this case looks like it's from the Tang Dynasty because it's got that similar glaze and dye technique, but really it's from about the 1900s. Um, so it's way later, um, but it looks very similar because even they were replicating their work later on um, to kind of pay homage to this time that was an explosion of art and culture. This case right here um, is the Americas. So one of the things that is a kind of common theme with ancient American artwork is that um, it is often fake. Museums will have things on display for hundreds of years that have, not hundreds of years, things on display for decades that they think is authenticated and someone at some point will come into their museum and say, nope, because of this little tiny thing on it, you can tell that it's fake. Um, that's because in the 1970s, people were really fascinated with the objects that were coming to light. And so they mass produced them and in order to sell them um, and kind of flood the market with fakes. Luckily, um, most of this stuff in this exhibition was collected by Anne Brunier. So Anne and Henry Brunier, um, Henry Brunier was the head of Rotary International for a while and um, he moved around with his wife um, and they traveled around the world and she was kind of the collector. And she collected a lot of the objects that we have um, in the museum and it was their original donation that kind of started university museums. Um, and when Anne was collecting things, she was doing so mostly pre-1950s and around that area. So we can kind of be a little bit more confident in the things that we have here because it was before that big explosion that flooded the market there. Um, so the signature object for this section is this Jaguar jar that is right here in the middle. Um, and that is from Peru, from the Moak culture um, that was there from around one to 700 CE. Um, and they were known for um, their complex irrigation systems for their crop development. Um, they, because of the way that they did their farming, they were able to have a crop diversity that has not yet been surpassed. Um, and so they were one of a really important civilizations of the ancient Americas. And their pottery is distinctive because they often featured mythological or naturalistic figures. Um, so that's where you see the jaguar um, in here. Um, and they were also known for being a little bit um, they were known for conquering. So some of those more um, strong and a little bit violent themes uh, come off in their artwork where you see this snarling jaguar instead of something that's a little bit more cuddly. Um, they also hand made their pottery. So when they were creating it, they didn't have a wheel. It's all hand molded um, and painted. Um, so that guy right there and the squirrel, um, more decorative jug here, uh, were from that civilization. Um, and we have a lot of stuff from Mexico, from the Aztecs, um, but a lot of this stuff is hard to find any information on it um, because again, there's so many fakes, it's hard for people to do research on these things because there's not a clear, um, there's not a clear archeological record. When studying ancient Greece or Rome or Egypt, there's, there's been practices in place for a long period of time that show like clear um, provenience is passed down for, for objects. Um, but a lot of ancient American archeology span at its beginnings was done on the down low, so there's not as many records. Um, but I will say this little head of a figurine here, um, also there's a replica, there's something that looks exactly the same as it um, in Yale's collection. 
Um, and they also don't know what it is because I reached out to them to talk to them. But these things were probably ceremonial. Um, they would have sat in houses. The doll, um, you can see a doll here that is attached. It would have been attached with string, but obviously it's attached with wire now because that would have degraded. Um, these things could have been used as toys. Um, uh, the big archaeological explanation for a lot of things is it must be for fertility or it must be religious. Um, so it's hard to know the purpose of a lot of these things, but these jars and these jugs would have been to um, probably do ceremonial things with them because they're a little bit more ornate as opposed to the Chinese bowls that were clearly used for eating um, because of their kind of more basic construction and decoration. Is there any questions um, about the Americas? Yes. Um, the monks? Yes. Um, is that immediately predating the Incas? Is that the same region? And how do you spell that? It's M-O-C-H-E. Um, and I don't know if it's immediately predating the Incas. People inhabited Peru um, from about 200 or Yes, 2500 BCE onward. Um, so there's, and there's a lot of dead space, um, not necessarily to say that there's dead space in the cultures, but dead space in the archeological record where we haven't uncovered transitional cultures. Um, so it's hard to know the exact lineage of things. Um, and kind of going on to more our US um, archeological history, um, colonialism has often clouded the record of the ancient American civilizations because when colonists came here and saw complex civilizations and complex building structures like the mounds that were built by the Cahokia people in the Mississippi River Valley, um, they assumed that it couldn't have been done by these people. They must have had help from white men because they couldn't comprehend how someone who was not of their same status could have created something that was so monumental. Um, so that's another factor in kind of clouding our, our knowledge of these civilizations because we have a lot of older records that were um, wrong, yes. Moving on over here to the ancient Egyptians, which are my favorite um, because it, they were, um, such a long, they have such a long history and such a long culture. Um, ancient Egyptian, really the beginnings of ancient Egyptian culture and society started about 4,000 BCE, um, which again is before the common era. So that would be about 6,000 years ago, which to me is crazy. Um, but even before the Egyptians, people inhabited this area. Um, and I think the earliest record of a burial, which is one thing that archeologists look for when establishing if it was um, a human and if it was a complex civilization. Um, the earliest instance of burial, it was in this area in upper Egypt, which again um, is a confusing term. Um, when I say upper Egypt, upper Egypt is Southern um, Egypt uh, because the Nile flows backwards. So it was found in upper Egypt about 55,000 BP, which is before present, which is 1951. Um, so anthropologists and archeologists really like to confuse you with the dating. Um, so people have been in this area for a very, very, very long time. Um, and the Egyptians, their civilization lasted so long. Um, it's said so many times, and I'm sure you all have heard it, but there's more time between Cleopatra, who was in um, lived in Egypt around 69 BCE. And the creation of the pyramids, which was about 2500 BCE, than there is between us and Cleopatra. So this civilization was something that we can't even begin. The United States has been a country for 200 years, and that seems like a long time. But they were growing and developing for such a long time. Um, most of the objects that you see in this case here would have been burial objects. Um, the Egyptians were very concerned with burial because they believed that you needed a good and proper burial in order to have a good life after death. Um, you had to be buried in a very specific way so your spirit could turn into your ak, which is A-K-H, um, so that you could live in the underworld. Um, and you wanted to be buried with 
all of the tools that you might need in that um, life after death. So they were very uh, they were very concerned with the types of monsters that you might encounter um, in that world. So your your very average things you would encounter in Egypt, um, scorpions and snakes and things like that, but also more mythological gods and things like that that um, you might need protection against. So on this side of our case here, we have some Shapti, um, also called Ushapti. Um, they are uh, typically inscribed with verses from the Egyptian Book of the Dead, which was a book of spells that were supposed to help you get to the underworld. Ideally, you'd be buried with 366 of these, which is one for every day of the Egyptian calendar year. These would have been um, the people who would work for you if you got called up to work for um, the pharaoh in this underworld. So you would want a lot of these so that you wouldn't have to do that work yourself. Um, down here also, we have a canopic jar lid. Um, so they had four canopic jars that were typically used to hold the most important organs. Um, the heart, which was actually what they thought the brain did. So they thought that you thought with your heart. They thought the brain was completely useless, which is why they just ripped it out and threw it away. Um, and the liver, the stomach, and the kidney, I believe, would go in each of those four jars. Um, and then we also have what I think is a mummified um, ibis here. We can't really see inside of it, um, but Dr. Moore and I, way back when, when we were curating another exhibit, kind of looked at it really close up, and you can kind of see something inside it if you shine a light just right. Um, but it was very common for them to mummify animals for you to take with you um, into the ancient world, and they would often gild them like this one is. It's gilded in gold. Um, and then the, the beak and the feet there are bronze. Um, at the top here in the center is the signature object for this section of the exhibition, which is it's a gilded wooden um, statue of Isis, who was the Egyptian uh, kind of mother goddess. She was the mother of Osiris, who was one of the main gods, and she is popular throughout the entire ancient world. So it's another one of those instances where there's a lot of cross-cultural exchange. She had cults. Um, there were Roman and Greek cults to Isis, um, which worshiped her as their main god. Um, she's often seen as just a really strong mother force in the ancient world. Um, she's often depicted suckling Osiris and kind of giving him life in that way, um, which is why her hands are the way they are. I think there is a little Osiris that's missing from this, this statue. Um, and let's see. So the goddess Isis is probably one of the oldest gods um, that we still talk about today. She was first mentioned in about 2375 BCE. Um, and that was in the pyramid texts. So before the Egyptian Book of the Dead, there were pyramid texts. So they would write all of those spells on the inside of these burial chambers um, so that the deceased could have access to them um, in that way. So first mentioned there. Um, and she's seen as the giver of life um, and food. And she's also, she has a lot of roles in this polytheistic um, religion. But she's also seen as kind of a precursor to um, Mary in the Christian religion. So um, a lot of the time when you see images of Isis, you can kind of put them side by side with images of the Madonna and child and see how people, even when they were um, talking about Christianity and making images of the important people in that religion, they were kind of drawing on um, the forces that were already there in order to um, whether it was because they saw that this was effective imagery um, because Isis was so popular in the ancient world or if it was to get those people who worshipped Isis on their side to be a part of their religion. Um, so the middle figure is Isis and then the far left figure is Isis. And then this is the top of a bust of Osiris who um, again was one of the main gods in the Egyptian religion. Do you guys have any questions about this stuff? Or 
Yeah. So I think not necessarily. Um, it's hard to tell because a lot of the time when we actually do find stuff, it's in the context of burial because houses would have been looted. Um, so it's one of those things where we would assume that they would probably be um, in homes, especially since this was a goddess who they would worship every single day, um, like we do in our modern religions. Um, but again, it's hard to tell because you don't, archaeology is tricky because you don't always know if they meant to leave it where they left it. Um, yeah. Shopti, I would definitely say, would probably only be in a burial context, though. Um, and also the mummified, um, mummified animals. But the statues are a little bit tricky. This is our next section of the exhibition, uh, which is the Roman section, um, and also the Etruscan section. Um, before COVID happened, I initially wanted to have more Etruscan artwork here because I think that we don't talk about the Etruscans and they were a pretty big part of, especially Rome's development. Um, so right in the middle here, we have a little gold medallion that is Etruscan in origin. Um, it has two, um, two soldiers fighting on it. Um, because of the impracticality of making something like this, it was probably, because um, it, it's hammered gold, um, and very specifically hammered gold, it was probably a burial object because it wouldn't make sense to make something this extravagant to, um, to just have in your home to look at. Um, a lot of the time when they spent a lot of time making something, it was so that they could have a nice object with them um, when they were buried. Um, so the Etruscans were in Italy um, before the whole Romulus and Remus myth um, of Rome happened. So Romulus and Remus are the uh, famous twins who are said to have founded Rome. Um, Remus was killed by his brother Romulus. Uh, that's why we call it Rome and not Reem. Um, and so he started, um, he's, he's basically there were seven hills and he basically picked a hill and started building. Um, which is a short story. Um, and the Etruscans were there before that. So in the Aeneid, um, there, you hear a lot about the Etruscans. Um, they were <sighs> fighting against and also helping the Romans at this time. Um, and their culture was something that very much influenced um, archaic Greece and also Roman architecture. In Roman temples, you often see um, the, the Etruscans had the, the kind of triangular shaped pediment first and Romans kind of copied that. Um, and Roman culture is often, if you look at um, the architecture and things like that, it's often a combination of Greek and Etruscan that they have just kind of made their own. Um, so the Etruscans were definitely a, a big force in the ancient world uh, for quite a long time. And they're best known today by their tomb paintings. So they have frescoes that were in their tombs that are still visible today. Um, I have personally seen them and been in them. Um, and they have um, just like complex imagery and colors that have lasted for hundreds of years. Um, and the main section of this case is Ro our Roman objects. Um, a lot of that is glass. So the Romans, no one really knows where glass blowing started. Um, some people say that it started with the Romans. Other people say that it started somewhere else in the Mediterranean and the Romans kind of are the ones who had last, kind of made it the best. Um, but about 50 BC is where, BCE is where we see kind of glass objects that are blown show up. In the, in the Greece section, there are some objects that are glass that are core formed and they're a lot older, but Blown glass um, started in about 50 BCE. Um, and it kind of exploded in Rome. Um, all objects, there's probably a glass version of it. Um, there's, you can see a couple cups, um, something that would have been to store liquid up here at the top. Um, you see more decorative things like this um, two-faced, if you come and look closely at this in the middle, it's got two faces on either end. Um, and you see all of these things at the bottom, um, which I got yelled at because I wanted to use a bunch of them in this exhibition. Um, and they're called unguitarium, unguitariums, or unguitaria in the plural. Um, 
And basically these would have been things to hold cosmetics. So um, when you mixed up your stuff for makeup, eyeliner, whatever, you would put it in um, this so that you wouldn't have to mix it every single day. Um, so yes, if you're ever curious about how they wore um, makeup, that is a very interesting topic because most of the time it was very toxic things that they would put on their face. And sometimes even um, in some cultures, it was dung that they would use. Uh, not their own, but animal dung that they would use to make these pigments and um, cosmetic products. We also have this really, really cool ceramic bead that, um, or I'm sorry, it's a glass bead um, that has, you can see little faces on it. So it's something that's very, very intricate. And again, something that they were able to create years and years and years before machinery and electricity, um, something that would have taken an incredible attention to detail to create um, that has survived all of these years. Um, the signature object for Rome is this little coin here, um, which is kind of hard to see, um, and you can come up and take a closer look. The back side of it um, is very hard to pick out, although if you're interested in this, Dr. Hollander is doing a speech on coins um, later on in the year, so check his talk out. Um, and he, he, he emailed me the other day and said that he, he thinks he found out what the backside of it would have looked like. Um, so, but this coin, um, while it says Marcus Antoninus Pius on it, was actually Caracalla. So he was the Roman emperor um, in about, I believe, 217 um, CE. And he was the son of Septimius Severus, who was a North African of, of North African descent. Um, he was a pretty well-liked emperor of the time and one that, um, one that did a lot of things for Rome. You can see the Arch of Septimius Severus. I think it's in Northern Africa. Um, and that's a pretty big architectural feature um, that's left standing. Um, and so Caracalla was his son and he, um, is known in his portraiture for having kind of a, a very severe face. He has a, character, a characteristic X on his face because he's known for having that very serious, very intense warlike um, imagery. Um, his reign was not the greatest. He ended up kicking out his brother and uh, performing a denot Demnation Memoria, which basically he got rid of all the images of his brother so he'd be erased from history. Um, but he was named um, Marcus Antoninus Pius uh, in order to connect the family rulership to the previous um, Antonines, so of which Marcus Aurelius was a part of. Um, so that's, that was a common practice in ancient Rome was to connect yourself either to the divine, which um, Augustus did by saying he had divine ancestry with the Arapacus, um, and also um, like they did in many other areas too, where they wanted to kind of show that we are not of their same bloodline, but really we are um, through naming. And that is all I have for this section, unless you guys have any questions. I agree. Um, and I was, so originally I think, I don't know what we had her attributed to, um, but I did some research and I found her, oh goodness, I think it's at the Met. And I think the British Museum of Art also has um, a doll like this um, that is attributed to ancient Rome. I think it's 300 BCE is what she is, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and what kind of tipped me off to her being Roman, because I don't think we had her attributed to anything beforehand, um, is her, her hairstyle. Um, that's very um, characteristic of what, oh my goodness, Julia. Um, her hairstyle wasn't all of her portraiture, um, who was a part of a family that I cannot remember. Uh, Julia Domina, who she, um, her hairstyle was very big and it was very beehive-y. Um, and you can see that in a lot of the portraiture of that time period. Um, and that would have spread throughout the empire as people saw those portraits and they would be passed throughout the empire. Um, and so that's kind of what tipped me off and led me down the Roman path with that one. 
Um, but there are people at, um, like I said, I think the Met and the British Art Museum who have similar objects that they attributed to Rome in about 300. So these guys here are the Tang horses, um, which are very popular. Um, anytime we talk about curating anything, um, people bring up the Tang horses, um, or at least in my experience. Um, these are a part of the same dynasty that I talked about over in the Chinese section. Um, but these are a little bit bigger representations of that kind of extravagance and um, that you can really see the intricacy of their dye process with these things. And again, these are from about probably 600 to 900 CE. Um, so about uh, 1500 years ago, a little bit more than that, maybe a little bit less. Um, and so these again would have been found in burial contexts. Um, again, a lot of these cultures have very similar um, ideas about death and about um, kind of giving the dead something to take with them into whatever afterlife they may be going into. Um, so in China, there's many different um, eras of burying things with the dead. Um, and you see these, which would have been part of a larger um, court that would have been seen with someone who was a little bit more, um, I would say high on the social structure um, because they would need something to transport them uh, throughout the uh, underworld. Um, sometimes uh, these are found with chariots. So these would be horses that would be lined up with a chariot that would um, be there for the deceased to have in their life after death. Um, the lady in waiting would kind of be part of a series. The lady in waiting that is in that case would be part of a collection that would be for there for the deceased. So yeah. Do you have any questions about these guys? Um, these are the things that are the most represented, um, I would say, in modern culture. You see replicas of these things everywhere. Um, like I said, uh, Breakfast at Tiffany's, I think, has a little miniature tang horse, pretty in pink. There's one, like the nicest hotels they, that they stay at in pretty in pink. They have little replicas of these things because they really, are, have, have, they really have been seen as um, objects of extravagance today. So this case um, kind of looks very similar to the Roman case, um, and that is because this is the Near Eastern section of the exhibition. Um, so you can kind of see uh, that they also did gloss very well. Um, and there's a lot of speculation about like who got to gloss first. Was it the Near East or was it Rome? Who harnessed it first? Um, but they were probably developing things at the same time because they would have been in communication with each other. They wouldn't have been isolated um, from one another and they would have been, again, sharing ideas and products and things of that nature. Um, so it was really important to me to have a Near Eastern section of this exhibition um, because it's often something that if we talk about China and the Americas, the Near East is often left out. Um, a lot of the time it's because of political tensions that are current. Um, sometimes it's because we just forget that there were people in that part of the world um, during that time period because we don't have time to get to it. Um, but this was definitely a time period, uh, an area of the world that was very active um, in the ancient world. The Seleucid Empire, which is in um, modern day Turkey and at one point covered the entire Iranian peninsula um, was pretty massive at one point. Um, they started their, they were at their biggest in about 250 BCE. Um, and they actually interacted heavily with the Romans. Um, there's a lot of stories if you look through Roman civilization um, history, there's a lot of stories of conflict between them and the Romans. Um, but they were a pretty, pretty massive force in the ancient world. Um, and in this section, I also put all of the ancient coins that I discovered in our storage room when we were cleaning everything, um, when we were organizing everything. Again, um, I came across these coins that I was just so fascinated with because they looked really old to me. And it turns out they are. Um, so a lot of the coins are from the Near East. Um, I have maps here because for someone who doesn't study ancient history and even for someone who does study ancient history, it's hard to visualize where these things are from without a map. Um, so each of the coins has its own little map here so you can see where it's from. Um, we have a coin, we, a lot of our coins are from Parthia. Um, so Parthia was another one of those big empires that uh, kind of communicated with the Romans a lot. 
um, and especially Artabon Artabanus II. Um, he was a pretty successful uh, conqueror and a pretty successful ruler for his time, um, and he, he got Parthia a lot of land. Um, there was a lot of conflict at the end of his rule, um, but his son Mithridates II kind of took power and um, was able to keep things relatively calm. Um, and he really tried to, at the end of the Parthian uh, kind of civilization, they really tried to keep the peace with Rome so that they could kind of peacefully coexist. Um, unfortunately, they were ultimately unsuccessful and Rome kind of took over the whole Mediterranean there. Um, but we do have coins that would have been made during both Artabanus' reign and Mithridates, um, along with others here. Um, and there's little mirrors underneath them so you can see um, what the backsides look like. Um, there's also a few things from, I think Hermes is from Thrace. Yes, so there's an image of Hermes facing forward. Um, that one is from Thrace, which is um, just kind of uh, northern Greece um, in the little area that they inhabited there um, on the mainland. Um, and on the back of that, there's a goat. And then there's an image of, um, the one in the middle at the top there is an image of a Ruthisa with dolphins. And supposedly that's a very, very rare coin and it's very um, uh, hard to find. So it's pretty lucky that we happen to have it in our museum. Um, so with the glass in this case, um, you can see a lot of similarities between the Near Eastern glass and the um, Roman glass. Um, but these, the glazes that are on them or uh, make them look a little bit more sparkly and shiny. Um, and that's because the chemical composition of the gl glaze, um, when it's underground and under pressure for a long time, it gets the sparkly color. So it wouldn't have been this pretty in the ancient world. So to me, it's really cool that the fact that we're uncovering things, they're even more beautiful to us than they would have been when um, they had them in their homes. Um, but you can see that everyday objects were made out of glass. You have bowls that they would have eaten food out of. You have vessels that would have been there to hold liquids. The things with rounded bottoms, typically you would assume those are for ceremonial purposes because you wouldn't want a bottle that you can't actually ever set down. So it was probably something to be filled with oil or wine or whatever um, to be poured out as a libation, um, either to worship a god or on burial ground to consecrate it um, in that way. We also have more of the Anguitaria here, and this one has a little foot that is very complicated to do, even in modern glass blowing. Um, and you also have some that um, are standing up here that probably would have been laid down, like a lot of more of the Roman stuff over there. Um, so this is the Greek section of the exhibition. I know I said the Egyptians were my favorite, but the objects in this case are actually my favorite. Um, but that's mostly because I've worked with these two metal objects a lot. Um, I did a whole research project on um, these two vessels in particular um, because they're pretty significant um, in their construction and in their decoration. So these two are what are called lakathoi, uh, lakathos in the sing singular. These are oil vessels. So they would have been used to hold oil, um, again, to use for ceremonial purposes, mostly for burial. So in ancient Greece and other cultures, um, they had a practice of laying out the body for three days before it was buried. Um, and that was so people could come from afar to visit the deceased before they were interned. Um, and also to make sure they were dead because before modern medicine, it was kind of easy to think that someone was dead when they weren't actually dead. Um, so it was a little just in case uh, thing that they had. Um, the ones that are more decorated probably would have appeared on that um, kind of ceremonial area where they were laying out the body um, next to the body. And typically because of that um, use of these objects, they had images of mourners or of funerary practices or of um, funerary rituals or of dining rituals. And so a lot of cultures um, and a lot of, a lot of practices of the elite were being um, appropriated by those who weren't in the elite and they were kind of turning them on their head. So 
dining used to be a really big elite practice before democracy, and it was only for the elite. They had elaborate dining sessions where they would, um, they would have people sitting around and dancing and drinking, um, and there, were, there was someone delegated to watering down the wine, so depending on how much of a party you wanted to have, you could water it down only a little bit or a lot of a bit. Um, so this is the dancing around with the instruments being played, um, which was something that would have been typically done in an elite, an elite depiction uh, with people, and then there would be people lounging around. So I'm not 100% sure why this one is so weird and why it doesn't have the funerary objects or the funerary practices depicted, but my interpretation um, is that it was kind of playing into that culture of turning traditional practices on their head because they were starting to make all practices for everyone. Um, and this little lekathos behind it has um, a little bit more basic design on it. And that is because um, what my, my professor of uh, ancient Greece and pottery and archaeology co affectionately calls the Dixie Cups of the ancient world. Um, these are things that would have been mass produced for the everyday person to have as use in their burial. So they have, what are, they're called pattern lacathoi. So they have just basic patterns on them. This one, if you look closely, it has ivy leaves going throughout the center of it. It has a checkered design around the edges. Um, and it would have just been something that anyone could buy. It would have been affordable for just about anyone to use, um, so they wouldn't be left out of these traditions. Um, and we really wanted to, Dr. Mook kind of helped me start my research project with these two. Um, we really wanted to x-ray these things, but we don't have the means to do that because often they would have a false bottom in them. So there'd be a little ceramic insert, so they wouldn't fill the, have to fill the whole thing with oil. They could fill it to the top but the, the bottom of the vessel would have been only to about mm, probably where his, his loot is. Um, so I actually was able to, because of the way these Lekathoi are created, I was able to find an artist for both of these objects. So the decoration around the colors of these, of these vessels um, is kind of like a signature for these artists. So at the top of this one, you can see a zigzag pattern and then you can see these five palmettes with dots and tendrils in between. And then above that, you can see kind of a line, a vertical line design. That is the signature of the Athena painter. Um, and at the top of this one, you can kind of see distinctive lines and dots. And then the bands around it are distinctive of the Bell Dam painter. Um, and so the, one of the most interesting things about the objects in this case, uh, these two in particular, um, is that the Beldam painter was an apprentice of the Athena painter. So it's possible that these two objects were created in the same workshop in Athens and um, found their way back together in Ames, Iowa, um, thousands of years later. Uh, so the little pattern like a here was collected by Anne Bernier and this Lekathoi was acquired in 2013 as part of uh, the donation that Brett Drexler made, who used to be a theater professor at Iowa State. Um, so they came from two completely different people and still somehow found their way back together here, which is one of my favorite things about museums and archeology span is that thousands of years, these two things have spent apart. Um, they finally found their way back together. Um, also in this case are the little glass uh, core formed objects that like I said are a lot older. So these are about 500 BCE um, and these would have been formed around um, dung and sand, whatever they could use that would withstand the heat of the molten uh, glass being molded around them. Um, and so that's a little bit easier to make than blown glass. It's a little bit easier technology to harness. So these were able to be made a lot earlier. Um, and over here, these two objects are from uh, ancient Cyprus. So they're from about 2500 BCE. Um, and they are very indicative of the late Bronze Age um, with their concentric circle design on them. Um, so yeah, that is, concludes my tour. If you guys have any questions about this case in particular or any of the other cases, let me know.